Welcome to this episode of Against the Mountains of Madness. I'm your host, Jason Rennie, and joining me as usual is... I'm your host, John C. Wright. And today we're going to be talking about the gods of science fiction. There are so many to choose from. So maybe the best place to start is with Star Trek. That's definitely got... Uh, the original series has a bunch of different interesting gods, and you have uh, Q from The Next Generation and Voyager, and you have the wormhole aliens or the prophets from deep space nine discovery maybe has some but who cares um, <laughs> um but yeah gods in star the caretaker, trek the caretaker in uh, in star trek uh oh voyager uh, yes the care- lost in space uh, pardon me the guy in uh, star trek voyager was also a godlike being well it is star trek so. lost in space isn't it ah <laughs> uh, I like Voyager. So many people hate on it, but I think it was a great series. Not not Deep Space Nine good, but still. Anyway, um, gods in Star Trek. So, John, you have a theory. There are three different sorts of gods you find in the Star Trek universe. Why don't you start there? Yes. That my theory is that there are three types of gods that you find in the original Star Trek universe. Okay. And I think they I think that they carry over into the other uh, other seasons. Though I won't I won't swear to that. I'm guessing the first that is there's, there's, there's plenty of there's plenty of gods who are computers uh, who just pretend to be gods and are worshipped by the native worship, worshipped by the native population. <laughs> and yep. Gene Roddenberry was really good at maintaining a theme, which was in several shows, that saying even a, a working utopia, if it robbed man of his freedom and of his and of his soul, was reprehensible and, and could not be tolerated. It's fair. So uh, the god Landru in the in the show Return of the Archons mm-hmm. is actually a computer that was established to create peace and to stop all war, but it does this by controlling the population basically with a, with a type of mental control through the offices of these mysterious robed big beings who speak in a, a, a strangely reverberated special effect voice, uh, who I just think are the creepiest things of all time. Okay, I saw it when I was young, yep. and whatever you, whatever scares you when you're young stays with you your whole life. Yep, you know. Because they get to point a hollow tube at you and say, "You will be absorbed," which tells you what Gene Roddenberry's idea of religion was all about. Not a mm. not a very flattering idea, I no. should say. Uh, but Landru is just a computer and is overcome when he realizes that when he can, when the logic of what he's doing turns out to be detrimental to mankind, he has to destroy himself. You see? Okay. Uh, and that's that's a that's a famous trope. Kirk does that several times. Mm-hmm. Uh, the machine Vol in another episode is just this big serpent-like cave thing that has to be fed by its by its worshippers. But in return, they are uh, immortal, ageless, free of disease. They have no conflicts. They have no violence among them. And it's and it's literally the the, uh, the Garden of Eden. I believe the show is called The Apple, though don't quote me on that one. I'm not yep. sure of the, the okay. title of that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... Val has to make the mistake of attacking the Enterprise, and so for her own self-preservation, the Enterprise has to phaser Val to death. You know, uh, but even even had it been peaceful, it's pretty clear that Roddenberry would have preferred for the Federation to smash such false idols and and not give leave people in a utopia, because he saw utopia as a dead end, even if it was peaceful, even if it was free of war and crime. Yep. See, which is kind of a harsh thing to say, but I mean he's got a point. <laughs> it's not uh, wrong, yeah. Well, so, I don't know. Now, then there are beings that are actually godlike, though they don't they don't say they're gods. They don't pretend to be gods, but they're at least as powerful as Thor or Zeus or Odin was back in the day. Uh, and that would be the Organians, who, even when they're shot to death by Klingons, can't be harmed. They only look like they're dying. <laughs> they're not actually there. Their whole world is an illusion mm-hmm. created for the benefit of, of their human of their human visitors. And uh, the Metrons, who set up a a, uh, uh, a one-on-one fight between uh, the Earthlings and the Gorns, with Captain Kirk as, as the member of the arena. Yep. And he actually impresses the godlike beings because he does not kill his enemy when his enemy's down. You see? That's the moral of the show. It's, it, it was based on a short story called Arena, I think by James Gunn, but don't quote me on that one. Okay. Uh, and again, they, they claim to be a million years ahead of us evolutionarily. Now... There's also the Squire of Gothos. Although he uses a machine to reorganize uh, matter into any form he wishes, he's 
clearly a being made of energy, and he's a godlike creature. But he's a, he's a prankster. He's a god like Loki, or or better yet, a god like a little a little kid. He's pl- little kid playing pranks. Mm-hmm. Spoiler warning: that's the surprise ending of the show. You know, uh, and he can be overcome merely by having his parents show up and yank him home to be <laughs> to be punished for not playing with his pets nicely. Yeah, uh, Futurama took that off. Oh, it was hilarious! It's hilarious. Now, in addition to godlike beings, you know, like Q and like the Metrons and like the Organians, in addition to false gods like Landru and uh, and Val, there's actually God God who's who's referenced by name in in at least two episodes. Hmm. In the episode where they go to visit Apollo, the episode called "Who Mourns for Adonis," mm-hmm. and you get to see Leslie Parrish, uh, who is uh, the young lady who later married the author of Jonathan Livingston's Seagull. Okay, uh, his name escapes me at the moment. Um, uh, so he married. He married a famous uh, book writer, uh, all, all dressed up in her in her pink robe. In any case, of course, Apollo falls in love with her, and of course, she turns him down by by mocking him. And he it wounds his his uh, ancient Greek uh, pride, something terrible. Yep. And it turns out he's the last one, and he dies during the episode. Uh, and I should say he died after killing Scotty and then resurrecting him. Yep. Uh, so he's clearly got godlike powers because he can kill people and, res- and, and resurrect them. But he's he's just a, an alien. He's an energy being. He's he's a he's a he's not actually a god god. But when Kirk says to him, "We humans have an advanced uh, society. We don't need gods anymore." Except for maybe the one, you know. <laughs> the, I'm confident that the censors forced Gene Roddenberry unwillingly to put that line in, so it would not sound like he was saying that humans can outgrow God. Yep. You know. But I think that's what Roddenberry probably thought, but don't. I don't know for sure. Now, the funny thing is that canonically, in the background of the Star Trek universe, God, God, the Christian God, has to exist as a being, mm-hmm. a metaphysical being, not a physical one. Here's why. When they visit the planet uh, 8, 8924, otherwise known as uh, Rom- Romanus Maximus, yep. they meet a bunch of slaves who worship a sun god. And the slaves uh, are being forced to fight in the arena in front of a TV cameras, and it's just a modern 20th century Rome, mm-hmm. you know, complete with cars and, and, uh, and uh, TV and so on and so forth. And the, uh, the Romans, it's not said anywhere that the Romans picked up their culture from, from Earth. Though I believe there is an Earth captain there, but I think the Roman society was already also there, yep. and I believe that the the sun worshippers were also there. Okay, in the final episode, final excuse me, in the final minutes of the, of the episode, mm-hmm. spoilers. Lieutenant Uhura finds out that by radio uh, interfering, overhearing the radio communication on the planet, she finds out that the uh, the sun god is not actually the sun up in the sky, not not the nearby star, but mm-hmm. the son of God, in other words, Christ. Yep. And Kirk looks awestruck and says, "So it's all going to happen again. The Christians will rise up and you know overthrow the uh, overthrow the Romans on this planet as well." And now that's like I said, that's canonically established in the Star Trek background. Mm-hmm. So, how did the Son of God happen to visit planet eighty nine twenty four? In addition to visiting Earth during their Roman Empire as well as during ours, it's not an alien. It's not an energy being. That's not what they said. Mm-hmm. See. They said it was God. So, those are the three types of gods we see in Star Trek, in the Star Trek background. And all of them, I should say, have roots in uh, many other science fiction uh, stories, films, and fables. Because that's basically the three ways you can handle God if you're writing a story. You either handle him the way, let's say, Gene Wolfe and Cordwainer Smith handled him by making him God-God... Or you make him a super being, like uh, the star maker of Olaf Stapleton, who is actually the creator being, but he only makes Darwinian creations, so that you have to suffer for no reason, because he doesn't know what he's doing. Yep. He's not the Christian God, exactly, but he's a powerful being that makes universes. Yep. And any number of false gods, the uh, the gods of gods of Mars are, are fake. The uh, And that idea's been copied on any number of planetary romances, where uh, an Earth man with a sword is, is teleported to a primitive planet... Yep. Or a future planet where he has to rescue a princess or something. And the gods they worship always turn out to be some high-tech uh, society with psychic powers buried under the buried under the rocks or something like that. You know. Well, isn't that always the way? The gods are always false. <laughs> I don't know. What about the lawgiver from Planet of the Apes? He actually did give the laws. Is he a prophet? Or is he just a culture hero? You know? 
It's a good question. But yeah, in in science fiction, very rarely. I mentioned two authors who treat God as if he's if he's if he's, if he's for real, and also uh, Miller in his uh, Canticle for Leibowitz. Yes, actually mm-hmm. treats the Christian religion and the and the ideas behind it with with some sobriety. Mm-hmm. Uh, James Blish in uh, Mission of Conscience also does, where a guy performs an exorcism on a planet uh, because it has uh, proof that mankind was not created by a divinity. And then when he then when he commits an exorcism, the entire planet disappears because it was a diabolical deception. Uh-huh. It's a great story. It's a great story. Oh, I, I I must say I did enjoy the Stargate series where um, the overriding theme was, "Hi, your gods are false. Here's a machine gun. Let's kill them." <laughs> <laughs> now that's a story that both Christians and uh, atheists can agree is perfectly fine because who doesn't like smashing false gods? That's true. And I was a big fan of the first few seasons of Stargate, but in the last season, they decided to have their enlightened ones, who were, who were actually the second type of god, energy gods, yep. people who had achieved enlightenment and, and had bypassed time, space, and dimension, mm. you know, who were so who were so pure that they had turned into godlike mm. beings. In the early seasons, the enlightened ones had a clearly Buddhist flavor yeah, to the them, ancients, yeah, and their terminology and their. The look, at, the look of their uh, set direction and so on mm-hmm. was very clearly meant to be Buddhist. Yep. But when they decided to have the, the idea of having some evil enlightened ones, I don't know what you would call that, benighted ones, they said, oh, we're just going to adopt the habit, dress, and terminology of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. And those are the bad guys. So, if you ever run into the Roman Catholic Church in a science fiction story, and the story is not written by Walter Miller, they're the bad guys, because they're always the bad guys. Unfortunately so, yes. That is true. Yeah. Uh, oh, Gather Darkness by Fritz Lieber also was based on that exact same idea that all the gods were a hoax performed by the, uh, the priesthood class using high technology. But Stargate does him one better because they're the gods are not only aliens, but they can do things like resurrect the dead and reincarnate themselves because they're space parasites that crawl out of your nervous system and get into another body and then turn it so they're the same person. You can't kill them that way. You see? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, I just, I, I thought Stargate was great. I love Teal. He's one of my favorite characters because he's sort of, he's, he's as stoical and calm as Mr. Spock. Yep. He's got no nonsense to him and he's an ex-slave that they freed who wants to fight his old masters, you know, even though he thinks he's fighting his gods, but they're evil gods, so he's not afraid. Yep. What a great character. So, Actually, there was... Um, oh, in Stargate, there's one episode where Tilk is talking to Jack about... Um, oh, have you read the Bible? <laughs> and he's going, no. <laughs> and he's going, I don't know who this... I don't know who this Jesus could be, but he doesn't sound like a gold. It was, it was kind of a weird... Just throw away... Doesn't sound like a gold. Yep, yep. Occasionally you get writers who are not hostile to religion. For example, in Babylon 5, uh, he, tro- he, had a, he actually had a priesthood that was, I think, in charge of computer... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, they were, they were a, a computer espionage group or a, a counter-espionage or something. Uh, Technomages, I think they were called. And they were, part of the, they were part of the organized church, and they were monks who did their work for religious reasons, although it was in cyberspace perfectly legitimate perfectly perfectly respectful treatment of uh, a religious hierarchy you know and there were particularly some creepy things in that which could have been divine or diabolical especially since the shadows and the vorlons were apparently semi-divine beings you know sort of the vorlons explicitly were said to be look like angels yep to whomever observed them whatever your idea of an angel was so but they, so. in the in the lore of Babylon Five, they did that so that, um, well, effectively, so when they would appear to the lesser races, the lesser races would go, would bow down in awe and do as they're told. So mm. kind of sinister. That is, of course, a sinister because he 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 in the first season he made them the good guys, in the second season he he made them a bad guy. He just, and he did it in what I thought was an awkward fashion, but I understand why he did it because he wanted to keep the drama up. If you have a really good, really omnipotent, really powerful being on stage as one of your characters, if you have God on stage as one of your characters, drama-wise, you have to either come up with a reason why he can't solve all the problems, or or you lose drama. Mm-hmm. You see, uh, the writer H.G. Uh, Wells criticized, no, excuse me, Orson Wells 
criticized uh, C.S. Lewis's That Hideous Strength for exactly that reason. Now, I believe that Orwell was completely wrong because the, he, he mistook what the drama of the plot was, not whether or not the Tower of Babel was going to fall. That's a foregone conclusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're an ancient Greek and you're going to see a play about Prometheus, you know he's going to get nailed to the mountain. Yep. There's no question in your mind. It's not a surprise ending. Okay. The only thing that's going to be a surprise, the drama is who else is going to be affected and how is it going to happen. Yep. And in the case of the Tower of Babel, the question is, are you going to be inside the tower when it falls on you? Or are you going to save yourself and get out? And that's actually a real question because the, the main character in that book, Mark Studdock, has to decide whether to stick with the, the NICE, the National Institute of Control Experiment, the nice people, yep. or go with his wife. You see. But we're deviating from Star Trek. We're getting kind of away from Star Trek and, and, into, and into books now. That's true. I blame there's you. There's plenty of other movies to talk about. We haven't even talked about uh, Star Wars or uh, you know, anything else. That's there's, true. There's also godlike beings around. I've, I've always been fascinated by... Um, in. It was in some of the books they explored it a bit further, but uh, Q as a character in the TNG series, and then later you discover um, there's a whole Q continuum, a whole a whole world of these beings. And in Voyager, the crew travel to the Q continuum, and it's represented as this desert road or this desert highway with um, the various Q standing around ignoring them. Um, I've always, I've always thought the Q were interesting because people like go, oh, Q's omnipotent. Q's not omnipotent. How do you know? There's more than one of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the giveaway. You can only have one omnipotent Jordan, being. Jordan Peterson, this is, this is off topic, but I hope you'll indulge me. Jordan Peterson proposed the theory that uh, polytheism lends itself to collectivism for the same reason monotheism lends itself to individualism. If you think the universe is run by one rational mind, the creator and the sustainer of all worlds, then your own, and you don't think your desires and passions are godlike beings. You don't think your wrath is named Mars or your lust is named Aphrodite, for example. Mm -hmm. Then you tend to believe that the individual is paramount and needs to have control over his, over his being. Whereas if you think the gods are willful and kind of irrational, whimsical, Mm -hmm. And there's many of them, and they and they fight each other. And some this might be a king of the gods, but there's still a council, and there's still a. Uh, uh, it's a bit of chaos. It rises from chaos, and, and it never quite escapes from being mm -hmm. chaotic. And the gods overthrow the earlier gods. There's not the, you're. It's it's like living in a place where there's no one law. There's no one principle yep. to which to direct your attention. You can't pick one god and say this is the ultimate. This is the good at which I should try to mimic. You see, because the gods fight each other, and so they're all bad guys in some sense, in some in some ways, mm -hmm. but not a monotheistic god who can be much more like a platonic concept of the ultimate good, the ideal of good, or the Aristotelian concept of the unmoved mover. You see, mm -hmm. which again, which is why it's easy to put gods into science fiction stories, but hard to put God God. If God ever shows up, he's usually a fake, and Spock is going to shoot him with a. With a Klingon phaser weapon. Why does God need a in spaceship? Fifth, in the fifth movie. Yeah, why does God need a starship? Yes. Why does God need a starship? Now, God might ask you to undergo some penance or do something for your good, you say. Hmm. Or uh, the God in Lord of the Rings might be moving in ways you can't foretell through an act of mercy, for example, leading to a salvation beyond all hope. Just for example, if you want to mention Lord of the Rings. There's another movie that does it does have God in it, but he's never mentioned. He's never on stage. He's never called by name. But he's there. Yes. But he has to be in the background. Or, um, there was a very funny skit uh, that sort of illustrated the concept from uh, the Mitchell and Webb look um, where they had, <laughs> they had two superheroes, um, Angel Summoner and the BMX Kid. The BMX <laughs> Bandit. Oh, the BMX Bandit? Yes. You know the skit? Yes. And the BMX... Oh, not only do I know the skit, <laughs> I can practically recite it from heart. It's one of my favorites. I know. I just because thought... anyone who's wondered why Superman and Batman are on the same team, <laughs> when Superman is a guy who can do what Hercules does and more, yep. whereas Batman throws a boomerang, <laughs> you have to go, wow. <laughs> yes. And Angel Summoner can summon up the angelic host, and the BMX, and BMX Bambit can, can do pull tricks. a wheelie <laughs> to do a trip 
trick shots. Oh, it's great. It's I, and I didn't interrupt. You were going to make up some point about the uh, the skit. No, but I just I, I think yes, we're talking about God being on stage. It's not God, but it's the same sort of problem. Um, yeah, the, the, they're trying to solve some crime, and it's very easy to solve everything by summoning a host of angels. <laughs> right, it's, right. It's, it's the a host of supernatural <laughs> angels. Uh, but see, that's that's the power. The problem there is that, and this is a problem with a lot of writers. If you want to have a godlike being on stage, but you don't want to give him the real limitations of real godlike beings, because they they do exist. There are certain things that the Christian God cannot do, mm. such as, for example, be evil. <laughs> God can't do that. Now, you can argue with me as to whether he can't, whether he can, he can and he won't, or could and he and he isn't, or whether that's his nature or whether that's his desire. But then again, we're talking about a uh, an infinite and simple being that doesn't really perform actions the way we understand them. Although we do understand that he causes all actions in time. Then you get into philosophy and, and everyone gets confused and goes cross-eyed. <laughs> but basically, I have yet to see a story where an angel comes on stage and the the hero goes, great, an angel, smite my enemies. And the angel says, if I do that, they go to hell. <clears throat> Why don't you convert them? Because what I'm fighting for is different from what you're fighting for, human. You say, mm. <laughs> your, your concerns are temporary, whereas mine are eternal. D do you see the problem? Yes. If you're if you're an infinite being, you're you're concerned with with uh, the big picture, and it might not be, fit into your your drama of Indiana Jones trying to get the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Hey, is Indiana Jones another example? God doesn't come on stage, but something comes out of the box. Yeah, and melts the Nazis. It's one of the best scenes of all time. And in the in the third film, he um, they have the Holy Grail he, on scene. He drinks from the Holy Grail. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. But in now, the but in the second one, there's uh, weird Indian gods, and in the fourth one, there's space aliens. So I don't know. <laughs> sure, but the weird Indian gods and the and the space aliens, the weird Indian gods are just. I don't think they're on stage as gods. I think it's just one of the priests has a psychic power. Yeah. And the space aliens are, are just space aliens. They might even worship as gods. Well, they would be. Uh, they would be the type of. Uh, did someone worship them? Did someone set up monuments to them, and so on and so forth? Well, that was the implication. So. By the way. I might be wrong about Landru, because I called Landru a god, but uh, uh, the same as Val. But here's, but it occurs to me there's a technical definition of the difference between a god and an angel, or a god and a saint, or a god and a demigod. Mm -hmm. uh, you sacrifice to gods. Yep. Well, you you could have sacrificed them. to appease their wrath and to, and to make yourself right with them. Yep. Now, I think the pagans, you could sacrifice to a demigod, and I'm sure the... Uh, the uh, the Hindus sacrifice to all their gods as much as they can, but uh, the in the Star Trek episode, no one actually commits an act of worship or sacrifice to Landru. He's just their he's just their leader, I think. And there, there seems to be a hierarchy, but I'm not sure if he's actually. I don't know if he's pretending to be a, a divine being, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There's also another episode, by the way, in Star Trek where there's an angel that the little kids sing to and summon him up. And I think he turns out to be an energy being of some sort of malign energy. And when they mock him, he gets all ugly. You know? Are so. there any non-malign energy beings in Star Trek? Yes, I mean, I'm sure the there Organians are, but... are absolutely benevolent. <laughs> Who? And the Metrons oh. seem to be malign at first, but they actually show pity to Kirk when Kirk shows pity. So yeah, there's some. Okay. Now, Q is an interesting concept. Q is an interesting case, because he's neither malign nor benevolent. It's my personal belief that in the first episode, the far point, uh, the first episode of the next gen, yep, yep. Uh, he was kind of representing, he was kind of the the, the uh, incarnation, if you will, of the force of the unknown, of what outer space actually was. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to throw yourself into outer space and, and risk life and death, uh, meeting things that you can't op comprehend, uh, Q by setting certain challenges in front of the Enterprise said this is what you actually are going to be doing when you're meeting things you can't comprehend you say, and, and did he mean himself or did he mean the, the wild black yonder you know the, the, the final frontier I think, it, I think symbolically the, the author meant, meant both mm -hmm. say that he actually had a kind of a symbolic role at first that 
that later is the, the, the character became popular and, and they used him in later ways in other episodes. I believe Cisco actually slapped him around a bit or something. Yeah, he punches him. He gets showing that Cisco is the most impressive of the. I'm sorry, say again. I said, yeah, he the, he gets into a boxing match and he punches him in the face and Q's there going, "You hit me. Picard would never hit me." <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Cisco more than I like Picard. Yeah. Call me, uh, you know, tastes differ, but that's one of the reasons why. Yes. That's one of the reasons why. And then Q never also, comes he's a back. Man. No, Q he's, never he's comes. A guy with the kids. Sorry, he's a father, and I, I, and I like fathers. So I like anyone who's a, uh, you know, I'm a family man myself. So. Ah, did you see the episodes of Deep Space Nine where Q becomes a father? No, no. Uh, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of later Star Trek that I just missed. Ah, uh, you know, there are periods of my time when I didn't own a TV. <laughs> periods uh, of my life when I didn't own a TV. So, no, but there's the, a, uh, a, the original series I saw over and over again. You know. Okay, there's a whole storyline in Voyager where um, Q turns up and um, they meet they, they meet a Q who goes by the name of Quinn imprisoned in an ass in a comet and he wants to commit suicide because he's done everything and that's the only thing left to him to do um and then by he, the way that, that's the there's a lot of stories written by secular people who treat with immortality as if it can only lead to boredom and I chide my fellow authors for their utter lack of imagination unless unless it's unless it's merely a thing that mortals say to themselves to uh soothe their fear of being mortal but otherwise it's just it's a it's a childish idea but go ahead i'm sorry uh, i didn't mean to interrupt oh that's fine but um but eventually he kills himself later in the episode which starts a q civil war um where uh voyager gets caught up because there's all these supernovas going off which is a spillover from the q civil war and then voyager helps them broker peace and then you meet um the lady q pe- played by uh, Susie Plaxon was one of my favorite Star Trek actresses. Mm. Um, and then her and Q mate and have a child who turns up and is actually played by John Delancey's son later in the series. <laughs> um, and Q dumps him on Aunt Kathy on Voyager to raise the boy because he's just completely out of control as only an omnipotent, well, a near an approximately omnipotent child, spoiled child would be. So. Yes. Um, yeah, there's a whole storyline. Um, it's it's quite fun. I like the Q episodes of Voyager. I think they do some. One of the things I like about Voyager is they do interesting things with like the Q character, and they do interesting things with the Borg, and make them. They flesh them out a lot. So, um, I don't know. I myself think that was a mistake. I like the Fair I enough. far preferred the Borg before they had any personality. Although I certainly liked uh, seeing that actress uh, poured into a skin tight uh, uh, cat suit. Uh, what was her name? Uh, when you're going to list a, a, uh, uh, your, your favorite Star Trek actresses, in my case, the list is going to be very long indeed because <laughs> I like almost all of them. You know, yeah. not, to, not to say I didn't like the actress, too. I, I, I based my life on trying to be as much like uh, Mr. Spock as I could. I wanted to be a, a completely stoical and uh, logical creature. So. But in terms of in terms of gods, uh, the in in real pagan mythology, there are some gods who, when they're children, are just total brats. Mm-hmm. Ganesha, for example, steals the moon out of the hair of his father Vishnu the Destroyer, and plays with it and throws it underwater so that the sea gods are distur- are go- blinded by the moonlight and the moon palaces on in the uh, in the divine in the divine heaven of the moon are shaken to their to their foundations. And uh, Hermes, uh, on his first day of being born, steals the cattle of the sun and uh, uh, by driving them backward in their own footprints. So they seem to be going the opposite direction. They can't be, no one can trace them because he made them go backwards in their footprints. So, the little rascal. I wonder where these, I wonder where these stories come from in history. Um, supernatural, uh, horrible beings committing pranks on people. Mm. Or... There's symbols of things that occur to the psychology of most men. And so when they say, hey, I bet when Thief was young, I bet when the concept of a mercurial personality was young, when the archetype was young, it goes with this idea. He probably committed, uh, he probably stole things when he was young. The idea of having gods be born of other gods is is because certain ideas are born of other ideas. Yep. You know? Uh, So. (sighs) 
and what do we make of um star wars with the force which that is an excellent question i have two theories one is that he is that george lucas was uh like ursula k Le Guin, had a certain affinity for oriental mysticism and wanted to put some in his film because he thought it was interesting and thought it was something his audience would like mm -hmm. uh theory two Star Wars was meant from the beginning to be a ninja samurai old western in space copying Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon as closely as possible while still putting in elements of Hidden Fortress or Ujembo or other films that Lucas liked. And so if you copy the elements of a film and you want to have weird, spooky, psychic powers come on stage, even if only hinted at, then you've got to have weird, spooky, psychic power. Uh, if you read the actual lines in the, in, the, in the original movie, the movie that I call Star Wars, but you youngins call A New Hope, uh, the Force is only referenced two or three times. Mm -hmm. Only two or three lines are said about it okay, by, by Obi-Wan Kenobi. And what is said is, is at so vague, you could not make up a theory or a religion or a metaphysics vaguer than this you know even whether or not the energy is real energy like psychic energy or whether it's a metaphor for something is just not clear but he does the hand does do? thing with the stormtroopers it does it, it <laughs> allows you to to uh distract simple minds it allows you to uh in the first movie it doesn't even allow you for to do telekinesis the first time we see that is in is in empire strikes back when luke calls his his weapon back to his hand his lightsaber back to his hand yep so, in the first movie, it lets you make a good shot and talk talk in someone's head after you're dead. In the second movie, you can form a blue ghost, you know, and, and, actually, and actually appear. Uh, Is this because special effects got better? No, no, because Luke was closer to the Force. Well, but I think the purpose of the Force is to be... If you want to have way cool mind powers in your science fiction fantasy background, then you have to have something that causes the way cool mind powers, and you have to come up with a cool name for it, and force is about as vague and cool as you can get. It doesn't actually mean anything, and you can also have a dark side, you know, like a force when it's out of balance. I'll point out, by the way, just as a matter of theological precision, there's not a light side and a dark side to the force. There's the force, and then there is a dark side to it, an abuse or misuse of the unity all life has in common with, with, with the thing that holds the galaxy together, you see. Now, everyone, including me, who saw the prequels where they said that the Force is controlled or manipulated by uh, mitochondrial bodies in your bloodstream, we all groaned yep. because that moved the entire look, flavor, and feel of the movie from the fantasy world where, where Obi-Wan Kenobi is a crazy old wizard living in the desert He's actually called a wizard in the yep. in the text, okay, in the in the story, mm -hmm. to a science fiction story where these, if you make your psychic power dependent on something mechanical, then you should, it should be treated mechanically in the story. For example, if Doctor Bones McCoy can inject you with a drug from the Plato's stepchildren planet that gives you telekinesis, it should be standard issue for all space marines working for the Federation, so they can go like this. And then go and yep. blast you with their minds. If Jedi power is caused by midochloriae bodies in your bloodstream, mm. then there should be a Jedi juicer where you capture Jedi, throw them into a into a pit, suck all the uh, all the blood out of their body, make it into a horrible elixir that the Sith drink, you know, and so they can increase their powers by vampirism. That's what would happen if it was if it was a if it was a technical science fiction thing. But Star Wars is supposed to be a fairy tale. It starts once upon a time. Mm. Okay? And you ruin the mood if you, if you actually make it too science fiction-y. Too scientific. So. No, I agree. Um, and the, the, the transport has the same problem, by the way. Once you realize that you can save on money by splitting your crewmen into good and evil versions, uh, you know, and the, uh, the evil version is the one who gets everything done, uh, then you should just be able to reduplicate your... Uh, Reduplicate your uh, uh, your crewmen as as often as you like. Just put an M3 in charge, uh, computer in charge of the uh, Enterprise, and have it create computers out of create crewmen out of the food processors as needed, and then dissolve them back into the memory space afterwards. That's what would really happen. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, you would. You keep. But you, you keep we don't read science fiction to read what really happens. And... We only read. 
I'm sorry. I, go ahead. I said you'd, you'd, you'd have a much smaller ship. You'd have all of your crew in the transporter buffer till you needed them. And no one would ever need to go to the bathroom because you'd just remove that. You'd just, you just uh, step through the transporter. Ha yeah. Handle that for them as they go. But the slightest mistake in the transport, if it's trying to yank urine out of your groin, who knows <laughs> what might happen. I mean, there's plenty of transporter mistakes on the TV show. You, you know, you're not going to... I mean, listen to Bones McCoy. Bones has the right idea. <laughs> he doesn't want to have his molecules whizzing around outside of the galaxy. So, uh, in any case, here's the... When I said there were three types of gods in Star Trek, I'd like to point out that only two of them actually have a code of conduct you're supposed to follow. Both Landru and Val outlaw violence. Mm -hmm. There's no violence on those planets. Okay, There's no war, there's no disease, there's no suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, the god god, referred to by the sun worshippers of planet uh, 8924, has ten commandments. Okay, And his commandments are actually stricter than those of the Romans who are busy uh, putting, putting gladiatorial games on the, on the TV. With, uh, complete with fake uh, cheering and booing uh, from their sound effects guy, which I just thought was hilarious when I was a yep. kid. But Q, Q doesn't demand anything. I was hoping, by the way, that Q did have a son and it would turn out to be the Squire of Gothos. I always thought that that guy was was a Q. He seemed to be have the same personality type. And I love the actor. I love the I love the way the guy handled the uh, the acting of it. Okay. Yeah. But it also shows you writers that you can have omnipotent and near omnipotent beings, and they still have problems. They still have difficulties. I mean, let's say let's say you're an omnipotent being, and you've created a universe where there's sin. How do you how do you get the sinners to stop being sinners because they've lost their ability even to yearn for goodness? You'd have to beam down to the planet and let yourself be killed or something horrible. Now maybe maybe uh, the uh, the the horrible alien Ra from Stargate can resurrect your body. But I believe canonically in the show, if you get resurrected too many times, you turn evil. Yeah, that's... You actually lose sanity points, like in a like in a game of Call of Cthulhu. I thought that was a great limitation on the uh, that is on the power. The the, the reason the Goa old are all sort of malicious and evil is because they've been through the uh, they've been through the sarcophaguses to be healed and well, and they're and also parasites. There's something about the psychology of a creature that lives off of other creatures, and everything in his life is a lie it pretends to be a deity instead of <laughs> well they have but they yeah. have they have the tokra in the series which are um the yes the uh parasites that are actually good effectively Benevolent. well they're not parasites they're effectively symbiotic because they want they will rather yep. they'll die rather than take a host by force and and in uh in deep space nine benjamin sisko's old friend got reincarnated as a cute young girl and she was basically that. She was basically a, a Tukra. Mm. Right? I can't think of her name. Was it the Jadzia Dax? Jadzia Dax and then later Ezri yep. Dax after, the, after um, yep. the actress wanted to go do something else. <laughs> and they killed her off. Oh. So for the last season. She, she was one, of, she was one of, of the list of actresses from Star Trek. She was high on the list. Because by merely by portraying what was supposed to be an old man, she, she behaved with a lot more like dignity and... and uh, 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 she was a lot more competent than than some of the other some of the other crewmen, and I kind of liked that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was an interesting character, um, yep. uh, but not a goddess. No. So. What do you make of the wormhole aliens? I thought they were always interesting because they were timeless beings, or they were maybe not time. They're outside of time. And they don't. There, I, I didn't see all the episodes of Deep Space Nine. I only saw the beginning and a few, and a, and a scattered few. I saw enough to make me want to see the rest of the show, and I just never have found the time. Oh, you should. They took, if you can. They took a page from uh, Babylon Five and decided to actually tell stories in story arcs, mm. which I thought was brilliant. I thought I thought that that was a turning point in television. Yep. In fact, I'd even say it was one of the entry points to the golden age of television that we've lived through. Uh, and. The attempt in the at least in the beginning is to have the wormhole aliens be so supernal and so alien that communication is difficult. Mm. So they're not like it's not like meeting Zeus when Zeus uh, he clearly wants something from him. he wants you to sacrifice your cattle and maybe he can dither with your daughter okay and you can't say anything because he's a god mm. and he's not like he's not like the the god of Abraham who who had ten rules that he wanted you to abide by so that you could be free not just from Egypt but also from sin yep. okay. 
Those gods can talk to people, even if they talk in riddles sometimes, or talk in parables. These were really alien aliens, and I'm reminded of the aliens from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Remember them? Yep. They create a monument. They create mankind out of ape man. They're godlike, but when they appear to uh, astronaut Bowman, an astronaut who is so generic that I'm amazed I can remember his name. He has no personality at all. Mm -hmm. He's just a human. He's the human in the, in the story. Uh, they can only show him images, like either flickering lights or uh, life inside of a Louis XIX bedroom, you know. And it's really unclear what's going on, and I think deliberately so. Arthur C. Clarke kind of, excuse me, not Arthur C. Clarke, Arthur C. Clarke made it clear in the novel version of what was going on, and uh, uh, the filmmaker, who's once again, whose name escapes me, uh, uh. Same, same guy who did same guy who did Clockwork Orange, yeah, 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 Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick. There you go. Stanley Kubrick wanted to have his gods be impressive, but not be human. So you had to keep them alien. You had to keep them strange. Mm -hmm. Now the aliens in Contact did a similar thing when when the uh, uh, when the astronomer goes teleporting up to the star Vega for briefly mm. and speaks with them, they take on the image of her dead father so they can talk as one, one human to another. Yep. But what they want is just is just odd and mysterious. They, they basically just are saying, uh, welcome to the universe. Okay. They're, they're benevolent, but they're, they're, they're not, it's not clear what they want. Arthur C. Clarke did a very similar thing in, 2000, in, in uh, Childhood's End, in the novel where humans are met by superior aliens and those aliens themselves are the servants of a higher more superior alien who is an energy being who is an immaterial kind of Gnostic body being yep. and I say Gnostic because the Gnostics are an ancient heresy that proposed that the flesh was evil and the spirit was pure and the way to enlightenment was to dissolve the flesh into, into pure spirit and to resume your native godhood the godhood that, that dwells within you so I'm answering a very simple question very very indirectly. The wormhole aliens were kind of, the writer was kind of painted into a corner because he kept them, he had to keep them off stage to keep them mysterious because if they came on stage and they became less mysterious then they'd stop being as godlike. They'd stop, they'd stop at least being uh, as enigmatic and the, and, and the enigma was the, was the appeal, was the draw. They you see? They did a few interesting things later in the series. Um, they fleshed them out a bit. There's, there's an episode where um, a, a poet has been lost in the wormhole for centuries and then comes back, and he thinks he's the emissary because he sort of fulfills the prophecy um, prior to Cisco, sort of. But he's arrived back because he's been lost in time, he's come back. But then they go and visit the wormhole aliens and they go, no, Cisco's the emissary and they just don't understand. They just don't, like, they're just, no, he, Cisco's the one we chose. Cisco's the emissary, not, not this guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's just, he's not the emissary. This is the one we picked. Well, in, th in that case, I have to propose that those, the wormhole aliens are not actually uh, godlike. They're just, they're just alien and they're very powerful. Oh, that's certainly Because that. they don't, they don't have any of the other earmarks of like Landru or Val or so on and so forth. They're sort of more like the Organians or like or like uh, the Metrons. Yeah. Except they understand humans even less. <laughs> well, they also have. Um... But by being outside of time, that's just a great idea for a story. And, yeah. And that's just you know, because how how can you have anything in common with a, a thing that doesn't occupy your same matrix of time and space? Well, yeah. Who just doesn't, doesn't experience time the way you do? Well, they have, yeah. and then you meet the Par Wraiths, who are um, prophets banished from the temple and live in the fire caves on Bajor. And they turn out to be very powerful space aliens. There's an episode where um, O'Brien figures out how to kill a Par Wraith um, to stop it from, because uh, it's trying to destroy the wormhole, because um, the Par Wraiths hate the prophets. They're like the good and evil in the... There's a whole right. story arc with them. It's kind of interesting. Um, and then at the end, um, the whole the whole battle with um, the founders comes down to the Par Wraiths and the Prophets and the final struggle between Sisko and Ducat because Ducat is following the Par Wraiths now. And <laughs> it's, it's all over the place. 
Um, it's fun though. It's I, I'm, I'm reminded of what I liked so much in of all things Babylon Five, where you found out that the shadows and the Vorlons were ancient enemies, and uh, uh, Sinclair, I think it is. Or maybe I'm, I always get the the two leaders confused because they swapped them out at the end of season one. Uh, their names, I get confused. Yep. Has to go to Zahadum, to the planet of the shadows, and he actually meets and talks with one of their emissaries, who has who says the most chilling things. It was like one of those perfect representations of evil, I think I've ever seen, because they they merely say that the ends justify the means. That anything that they have to do, to help you know whatever mankind evolve into the superhumans, they will do. Now. In the final episode of the of the season, uh, or actually in a special that was filmed later, they actually showed the far future of mankind, who then turn who do turn into something akin to the spoilers. Who, they they turn into the the Vorlons. Yeah, they turn into episode. two energy beings that are that are entirely uh, uh, transcendent of, of all the limitations of time and space and, and so on. Mm. Uh, but they're good. The humans learn how to be learn how to be good rather than evil over the over the uh, millennia. Well, the Volons, you know. the Volons and the Shadows are not good and evil in that sense as much as... I have to object. They're good and evil in the first season. In the second season, they're law and chaos. Well, yeah, that's he did it. He did, he did a swap quite deliberately because he had to give the Vorlons some negative aspects in order to make it so that they get kicked out of the galaxy. <laughs> Spoilers! Well, uh, at the end of their war. No, no, but the know. Vorlons, like, they're two sides. The, the Shadows want to promote um, striving by... Yeah, sort of chaos and war. It's bad, yeah. but the Volons aren't any better. They they want to do it through law and order and doing as you are told, sort of thing. But yes, the, but my objection is again, there's not even a hint of that anywhere during the first season on anything that Kosh says. Well, in fact, true. the way Kosh behaves is quite the opposite. It looks like they even redeem creatures like Jack the Ripper. By turning them into servants and giving them something useful to do. Which is one of my favorite episodes yeah. of the show. It's such a good episode. But you're right. <laughs> in, in, but you're absolutely right. In the second season, they're clearly supposed to be lawful neutral. They're, they're just creatures of law and order uh, and, and ruthless. And they had to do that in order to make them equally bad guys. Otherwise, they would just solve the problem. Mm. So, and the humans, in order to give the humans something to do, the two sides have to be equally balanced so that we get the deciding vote to make... Uh, to make our characters the the, the ones who decide the the issue. Yeah, and the same thing happens, by the way, at the very end of the movie Golden Voyage of Sinbad from 1978, I think it is, which you should go watch immediately because it's just a fun. It has Tom Baker in it, who played the real Doctor Who. Uh, I should say one of my favorite Doctor Who's was Tom Baker. Though there's, I do have several favorite Doctor Who's. The way I've got several favorite Star Trek actresses, uh, and the uh, in that the evil. Uh, the evil special effect stop motion monster is fighting the good special effect stop motion monster and the voice of the prophet yep. the mysterious prophet says the weak and mortal men can tip the balance between good and evil and the evil guy draws his sword and stabs the good monster in the back assuring the victory of evil I thought it was one of the greatest things <laughs> I'd ever seen that the bad guy listened to the prophet and tipped the balance which you know by the way he loses at the end I just spoilers he does not Sinbad does not die at this time. You were looking a little worried. I didn't no, no, worry about Sinbad. No, no, no. He, you can't. Was... Um, you, you can't have evil triumph. It won't make for a good film. No, no. You, you can't. You can't make. You can't have evil triumph unless it, unless it's um, transitory. Or a tragedy. Yeah. Well, well but yeah, because that's because he, all you have to do for that is read a newspaper. Why would you go to a film for that? Well, <laughs> you can. You can have. Um, you can have Thanos do the snap and destroy half the universe, but there has to be a part two to that. <laughs> yeah, you gotta win. You That's gotta win. That'd be a profoundly bleak movie. If oh well, what we were talking about gods in films. What about the Asgardians? Are they gods or are they just powerful aliens? Well, I've always. I've, I mean, it's Thor for goodness' sake. There's temples to Thor. I can point you to right now on Earth in real life. That's true. I actually, um, I've, I've, I always thought the. The Asgardians, as represented in sort of Marvel comics, was an interesting take on all of all of these sorts of, I suppose, lesser gods. They're like, I mean, like you say, they're archetypes and things like that. They're not, um, they're not god god. They're not, they're not omnipotent and omniscient. They don't 
they don't embody the divine attributes they're just super powerful people effectively um but i was but are, they super, are they are they super powerful aliens or are they super powerful archangels by which i mean are they are they supernatural or are they just you know like like kryptonians or or, or white martians or something um, you see the difference to the question? Oh yeah, no. In 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 the Marvel universe, they're clearly um, space aliens of some variety that are just very powerful. Um, it's sort of. It's, I would say yes and no. I would say in the movies, they're explicitly said to be powerful space aliens, but in the comics, it's unclear. Well, actually, because keep in mind, in Marvel comics, there's also creatures like Mephisto, and mm -hmm. you know, and the son of Satan is a is a is a character. So Satan is real. And the uh, the Hell Rider or the uh, Johnny Blaze, the guy with the burning skull. What, what's his Ghost name? Ghost Rider on the motorcycle. The Ghost Rider, he's cursed by someone. Uh, you know, so those things are real. That's true. And Doctor Strange calls upon uh, wild sounding creatures that aren't in any mythology book. I mean, he made them up, but it was mm. the Vashanti and so on are some sort of super being. As is Eternity, you know. But it's hard to tell. Is Galactus a god? He's not even from this universe. He's from the previous universe. What about the Living Tribunal? Or what about the Eternity? Or what about, you know... Now, in DC Comics, I have to say, it is absolutely crystal clear that DC Comics is in a monotheistic universe and that God is actually God. Because not only is Lucifer a character in their story, the Spectre was sent back to Earth by God. The voice of God appears in the, in the panel... You know, with saying "Go back to Earth and get to redeem the vengeance of God," and he's a ghost. Okay, Jim Carrigan turns into a ghost to become the Spectre. Okay. And there's there's no ambiguity there. That's actually just God, God. <laughs> yeah. Whereas in Marvel comics, it's hard to say who's in charge. There's so many super powerful beings, you know, and and they never explicitly say which one's actually actually running things. Did you? Um, I assume you didn't see Thor: Love and Thunder. You, that's a correct assumption. I like Thor, so I did not see it a was, movie that was made by his made by his enemies. It's an unfortunate film because it's terrible, but it has some really interesting ideas in it. Um, but, I almost went just to see the goats because I put those goats in one of my stories, one of my novels, because I remember the goats. Mm -hmm. And only Walter Simonson in the comic book remembered the goats and put them into the Thor comic because Walter Simonson had actually read some of the some of the Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. And he actually had things happen like when Beta Ray Bill picks up the hammer and becomes worthy of being Thor, uh, Odin in disguise travels among the dwarves and tricks them into building another hammer for Beta Ray Bill by means of Odin trickery, just like something from a Norse myth. It's really good. And when Surtur arises from the south to destroy all the universes, the three gods of Odin and Thor and Loki have to combine their forces, even though they're enemies. And and Thor can cry out for Asgard and Od and uh, excuse me, believe that Thor fights for the Earth. So Thor says for Midgard, and Odin says for Asgard, and Loki says for myself. <laughs> it's a great scene. It's a great scene. They do manage to overcome Surtur, by the way. Okay. Thanks mostly to Loki. Well, if you can so. if you can stomach Love and Thunder, um, I don't it, think I can. It's because it's it's a bad film, but it does have interesting ideas in it. Um, they visit Omnipotence City, which is kind of dumb, but um, it's the city of the gods where all the gods live, and it's, I don't know, I thought it was, I, I, I found the film frustrating because there was some, like, if it had just been dumb, it would have been fine. Um, but I, I, had, believe, I believe uh, Eternity, I believe the character of Frustrating me. I believe the character of Eternity from Doctor Strange does show up in, the, in at least a background scene as an, as an image in Thor Love and Thunder. Like a, like as a as a silhouette with four horns coming from behind his hood. I don't remember. But I haven't seen it, so I don't know. Okay. So we're coming to the end of our time. What do we do with uh, gods in science fiction? Just enjoy them on screen and ignore them, or can we learn something from them? <laughs> uh, I recommend the short stories of people like Cordwainer Smith and the novels of people like Gene Wolfe, who actually have thought these things through. And R.A. Lafferty, although he is a madman, he's a madman touched with genius. And they often treat with divine things uh, properly. C.S. Lewis, however, I think is the best of someone who treats with divine things. Uh, Maladil, God, does not come on stage and out from the silent planet. But the archangels do, as do the angels. 
although the humans can't properly see them. Mm -hmm. And he does a very difficult task, which we mentioned in a previous episode, of putting theologically correct information uh, over to the reader. Uh, And theology is a rather delicate science. You have to make sure everything is weighed and balanced correctly. And you also have to make sure that certain things that are that are uh, completely stark and not nuanced are put across starkly. And you got to know, and you got to know which is which. And he does that, and he can do it in a way that is simple and clear. So I would say the way to deal with with gods and science fiction is look at readers like Lewis, and then when you read a, a story of the Antichrist, let's call it Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein which is clearly the story of a false prophet who comes down from Mars preaching unchastity and blasphemy, teaching Gnosticism, teaching every man that he himself is a, is a god, which of which I can think of no greater blasphemy than that. That's actually the same lie that the snake in Eden yep. told to our mother Eve, okay? It's the same thing, yep. thou art God. What do you think he was saying? And the guy had psychic powers and could do miracles and there were signs and wonders and people started going, lo, he is there, lo, he is here, you know. I would say if you're going to write a story with gods in it, commit to the bit. Actually have them act like real gods would act, including pagan gods. If you've got pagan gods on stage, they should act like pagan gods, which means they should be impressive, but not the ultimate good, you know? Because Zeus is not someone to frell around with. He can turn you into a newt. (laughs) But he still upholds the guest law. He still has to uphold the divine order of the universe. And he still will smite you with a lightning bolt if you are if you suffer from hubris or overweening pride, you see. Yep. And the other thing I like about the pagan gods is, especially the classical ones, the Greek ones. Uh, many modern people want to have godlike beings on stage and make them people, make them men. H.G. Wells actually wrote a story called "Men Like Gods," mm-hmm. thinking science would turn us into gods. There's an entire school of thought called transhumanism. Yes. Which is about how we will make ourselves into immortal golem super robots with brains the size of Jupiter mm. uh, you know and then and rule the cosmos together uh, with our with our dark masters once we're free from all morality not all of them say free from all morality but a lot of them do yeah. so if you're going to treat with a god in the science fiction story I would ask that as a science fiction reader or science fiction writer you play out the logical implications of the premise you've set up and that means that means theological premise as well as logical premise, so that's where I would say to leave it. Fair enough. And certainly, everyone 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 wants to see Captain Kirk. Uh, uh, everyone wants to see Scotty get killed by Apollo. I mean, we want we want to see gods on stage, you know. Fair enough. This is true. So this is the second time, by the way, Scotty gets killed. He's also killed by Nomad the robot and uh, resurrected. You know. You can't keep a good Scotsman down. No, he's got multiple lives. He's got multiple lives. Why, I don't know why he's not being worshipped as a god. He clearly, <laughs> he clearly has as many lives as Voldemort. You know, he's a Death Eater. So, as is Gandalf the Grey and Spock the Vulcan. <laughs> Spock the Vulcan comes back from the dead. That's true. So he must obviously he's in a story. He's he's the same as Saruman or Gandalf. He obviously was sent from the West to help us become more logical and fight against Sauron or something. Yeah, sure. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining me, John, and. If you enjoyed the episode, like, share, and subscribe. And till next time. Adieu.